Hello, hello. I hope everyone is doing well. Welcome to another uh, Joe and Cat Chats. Uh, this week we're talking about the housing crisis, racism, and COVID-19. So there's tons to talk about. Um, hopefully Joe will log on and I can add him to the call right away because we want to get into it today. Um, so yeah, I hope that you are able to join us live and uh, happy to answer questions at the end if we have time. Um, of course, comment, ask questions uh, throughout and uh, hopefully we'll get to them all. Um, otherwise, we'll just wait for Joe to log on. Um, yeah, my goodness, I have been looking up uh, a lot about the housing crisis in my local city here in Toronto, Canada, um, this morning. So I knew it was a, an issue um, already because it's so hard to find a place as a renter here. Um, and it's so uh, intertwined and interconnected with racism um, that it's it's incredible how problematic. I'm just gonna add Joe, and uh, we're gonna get into it. Hello, Miss Wells. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm 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 going through it. I'm living it. I'm. There's a lot going on, a yeah. whole lot going on. There's a lot of juice, and um, yeah, this is going to be. And, and first, first, let's first of all, how are you? What's going on with you? What's going <laughs> I'm on with all you? Right. Yeah, you know, just living the, the mm -hmm. busiest life. I am. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel busy all the time, but it's busy good. all the time. Busy yeah. all the time. First of all, I, first of all, after Chelsea who's in the chat, after everybody watching. Okay, we're, we're obviously you and I are an international pair. You're in Canada. I'm in the United States, unfortunately, in the United States. But again, our message is international. We're trying to broaden our perspectives. We're trying to expand the horizons of what is possible with these conversations. And, and this, is, this is a difficult topic to discuss because it's housing. People need places to live. People need a place where they feel as if they are at home. People need to have access to fair housing. People need to feel like, you know what? Hey, I busted my ass to get a college degree. I worked hard. I make good money. You know what? I should be allowed to live in this neighborhood. And what we're going to do in the next 55 minutes or so is go over how racist the United States and Canada actually is with regards to housing for Black people and people of color. And we're gonna, what I hope everybody is going to understand is that the United States not only is racist and was founded on racism, but actually supported many of the policies that created the housing crisis that we have now, not only in the United States, but in Canada, and how all of that racism, all of these racist policies created what we have now and how it's going to get worse not only because wealth inequality continues to exacerbate, but because of this pandemic we now know as COVID-19. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for providing an outline of, of what we're about to get into. That's great. You know what, you know, <laughs> Catherine, uh, you know, I, I'm notorious for breaking things down. I like to slice and dice and chop it up. And, and I love doing that with you. So we're going to get into it because we have a lot to discuss and we have a lot of ground to cover. And I think, and again, because... We have, you know, the comp today's conversation, it's about racial housing segregation, okay? And, and again, I typically like having these conversations where I start off and define what these words actually mean. Because more often than not, when you define these terminologies, you figure out, damn, you know what? These three words individually have a meaning, but together it's like, oh, shit, this is really a big deal, it's greater than the sum of its parts. You know what exactly. I'm saying? You know, you can have an onion, you can have a tomato, and you can have a head of lettuce, but you put it together, you end up with salad. And that's a whole lot more appetizing than chewing on lettuce like a rabbit or eating a tomato by itself with a little bit of salt or having an onion because you feel like having an onion. So when you put it together, you get a salad. And it's this sort of salad of information that we're going to provide to everybody. 
Yeah, I love that. And uh, to go even further, I think that when mm -hmm. you break it, we break these concepts down, they become more manageable and the exactly. understanding sinks in so we can tackle these big issues that seem exactly. really intimidating. So Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. So as we've been doing for the past couple of weeks, we talked about, we said it's racial housing, se racial segregation, racial housing. So the first word is racial, but really we're doing a tackle it from racism. And we know, we'll know what racism is. Racism is when, hey, one group of people who think they're better than another group of people because of some physical or social characteristics. So for years, the conversation based upon, and I love my favorite prop in the, in, in the world, the Constitution. Constitution says, hey, yo, black people, uh, you're not really as good as white folks. So, hey, racism. August 20th, 1619. So that's really how racism got started. So then when you think about when Africans were trafficked from Africa to what is now known as the United States, and not the deep sound, we see your deep sound, London, England checking in. Black people were forced to live in a separate area than the people they worked for, white people. In, in all reality, Housing segregation started when slaves were, black people were brought over to the United States. And here I am just having this epiphany, like, well, wait a minute. Well, no, we're looking at home, home laws. And no, black people lived over there. White folks lived in a really nice house. Black folks lived in places that didn't have proper, you know, pro access to indoor plumbing, because really indoor plumbing wasn't a thing then. But they had squalid conditions. White people had really nice stuff to live in. So the housing segregation started then. And what is segregation? Segregation is when you, you, you enforce separation of people based upon race. And you do it in a particular jurisdiction, whether it's a neighborhood, a city, a street, a county, or in a grand situation, a country, which is certainly applicable. So segregation, separate people, separate people based on race. And what is housing? What is housing? Well, let's look at the root word of housing. What is housing? A house. What is a house? A house is a structure that we people live in. Hey, I live in a house, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a house. It's typically a house is a single family dwelling, but a house could be your, your apartment. You got a really nice apartment in Toronto. That is your house. That's where you live. Okay. My parents have a house. My dad has an apartment, but that is his house. It's where you live. Now, more often than not, we, it's a living space, it's basically wherever you live. Now, more often than not, people confuse or use interchangeably the word house and home. House and home. Hey, I just bought a new home. Well, no, you didn't actually buy a new home. You bought a new house. You bought a house. The house is a dwelling. You didn't buy a home. A home is all the emotions and all the feelings that are wrapped up in buying the house. A home is where you feel comfortable. A home is where you know, it's where you have your furniture arranged just the way you want it. And all your kitchen appliances where you want them. So you can reach for the food processor and not have to worry about it. Or you can get the Vitamix and not have to yell at somebody. Or you can have the dishes put away the way you want to. You can make up your bed the way you want to, however you want to make it up. Home is a feeling. Home is... <sighs> Home's kind of like love. You know? Home is like love. You don't know, you don't know when you're in love, but you know it when you feel it, mm -hmm. and it's just like home. Home, it's like you know what? Ah, this place feels like home, and it's and just like Chris Clark said in the chat, home is where your heart is, just like love. Love is where your heart is, and that's and that's the beauty of home. That's what homes and houses have such a special relationship, because homes are places where you feel like you could start a family. Mm -hmm. Homes are places where you feel like, hey, you know, I got a, I got a couple of trees in the backyard. Let me, bu let me build a tree house. Hey, I got about, you know, I got about 300 square feet in the backyard. You know what? A garden would be a great idea. You know, let me grow some tomatoes, get some basil going in the background, maybe a couple of cucumbers and tomatoes, make my own salsa whenever I feel like it. That's a home. A house, it's just, okay, here's the structure. Here's four walls, electricity, water heater, a couple of toilets. So mm -hmm. we, that's really what we want to make, get to talk about. Again, it's, it's not just housing. It's not just housing. Mm -hmm. Because, again, 
black people were locked out of buying a house. But more, but in addition to that, they weren't allowed to create homes. Right. And with homes, you create communities. Exactly. With communities, it, it, you, see, you see where I'm going with this. For sure. And I think that something that you actually brought up uh, to me was an aspect that of safety. And I think that yes. that is intertwined within this because what you need to, be able to feel safe in your home or in yes. your house in order or to, your neighborhood. To, and then also, yeah, I was going to say it, it expands to outside the home because your community, your neighborhood, that also needs to be safe for you. Yes. Yes. Which is, um, yeah. Which is a problem for, for a lot of people who, um, which is a huge problem. Yes. Who end up in these segregated places and, and yes. it's all wrapped up in this conversation um, I, about what, started these chats between us is, is, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and defunding the police because where are the police presence? Uh, where are the people the most safe and where are they the most unsafe? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. all of that is, is wrapped up and interconnected when, in this conversation. So, yes. yeah, just yes. To, keep, to keep that in mind as we uh, continue. Uh, oh, as we continue, as we continue, absolutely. And in my notes, and, and I don't have a whole lot of notes, but I, I do like to write things down because Confucius says a short pencil is better than a long memory. So that's why I like to write things down from time to time. And I talked, and, and earlier on I said, oh, you know what? Housing segregation actually started when black people were brought over here from Africa. But then there are certain eras of housing, and we want to talk about them because we have before the Great Depression, mm -hmm. we have the New Deal with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and then what we really want to talk about is a lot of the racist housing policies that really came through during FDR's presidency. There's a lot of stuff that I don't think people know about. Then you have after World War II and after, after World War II. Then you have post-civil rights with the Fair Housing Act of 1964. Or I'm sorry, 1968, if I'm not mistaken, which essentially made unfair lending, um, which eliminated unfair lending. We have the subprime mortgage crisis from about 10 to 12 years ago, where a whole lot of people lost their houses and a whole lot of, and, and, and a whole lot of corrupt people who are now in the highest levels of the federal government were involved in the subprime mortgage low lending situation. Let, not to get off, not to go, divert too far away, but let's not forget that the current secretary of the United States Treasury is a gentleman named Steve Mnuchin. Steve Mnuchin was the president of One, One West Bank in California. One West Bank was involved in over 1,000 illegal foreclosures in the state of California. The attorney general at the time was a lady named Kamala Harris. And Kamala Harris had all sorts of evidence to throw Steve Mnuchin in jail for a lot of years and assess a lot of heavy fines, not only to One West Bank, but to, but to him personally. What did she do? She chose not to prosecute. Why? Because Steve Mnuchin donated to her campaign fund. Now, Steve Mnuchin is the Secretary of the Treasury. Do you, do you see how crazy this is? Mm -hmm. Do you see how crazy this is? Mm -hmm. Let's take it into another step. The current owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers is a guy by the name of Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert is a Michigan State University graduate. Dan Gilbert completely shit on LeBron James when LeBron James was playing for him during the Cleveland, during, during Cleveland, when he was there in Cleveland. Okay. He consistently, and he, uh, and he's the head of Quicken Loans. Quicken Loans was also involved in a whole lot of these subprime mortgages. Quicken Loans ended up kicking a whole lot of people out of their houses. Guess where a lot of that money went to in terms of economic development. It didn't go back into Cleveland. It went back into Detroit. And if you go drive around downtown Detroit, You'll see downtown Detroit is plenty gentrified, plenty gentrified. A lot of that money came from Quicken Loans money, and a lot of that money came from Dan Gilbert's pocket. Yeah, it's so complex how all of these things are so interconnected, and it's all wrapped in, in this sort of political situation that we find ourselves in. And, mm -hmm. oh, man, I yeah, I, I know... I feel like I'm a broken record, but holy moly, does this system need to be dismantled. <laughs> you know, burn it all down. Take yeah. a flamethrower to it, burn it down, 
have me and you rebuild it. <laughs> I mean, there's a large community of people that I think we could, you know, get to help rebuild. Oh, absolutely, system. absolutely. There's yeah. a few people I can call. There's a few people you can talk to and um, get involved. Me and you, we rebuild the whole <laughs> shit. Everybody lives happily ever after the end. Oh, yeah. We put a bow on it. <laughs> I wish. We put a bow on it. We put a bow on it. That's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to take care of business. But <laughs> now we're in COVID-19. We're in the pandemic scene and the pandemic era. And the pand it seems crazy to say pandemic era since we've only been involved in this for about four months, maybe five months now, since maybe end of February, early March. But in many instances, especially in the United States, we're going to have unemployment and benefits that are going to be ending. The $600 a week supplemental benefits are going to be ending for many, many people. We're also going to be having mortgage moratoriums and rent freezes ending at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. And landlords and mortgage holders and banks are going to want their money. And right now, there are 438 men and women who are sitting in Washington, D.C., who are twiddling their thumbs right now, wondering how to further screw over working class Americans by not, and by not canceling debt, by not having a stimulus package that actually bails out people instead of corporations and big banks that own a lot of these houses by not having a step by not having economic development by not having paycheck protection while not having a universal basic income while not extending unemployment for to at least the rest of this year for every american and the congress is debating that right now and so what's going to happen there's going to be a whole lot of people that aren't going to be able to pay their mortgages. There's a whole lot of people that aren't going to be able to pay their rents. And there's a whole lot of people that are going to be put out on the street. And then what's going to happen? All of these big banks that, that took over during the subprime crisis from about 10 to 12 years ago, it's going to happen all over again. But this time it's going to happen quicker. It's going to happen more efficiently because these banks now have a completely unlimited access of credit and capital through the Federal Reserve. And now homeowners who were even responsible homeowners and paying their mortgages on time, who couldn't pay because of this pandemic, they're going to be screwed even more and homes are going to be taken. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And my goodness, like getting a house as a renter is already difficult enough. Uh, getting a mortgage in a neighborhood you actually like and can afford are already hard enough. Uh, I was looking at a stat earlier. Um, mm -hmm. So before COVID, yes. about 30% of renters in Canada spent more than half of their income on rent. That's ridiculous. Which means, and so affordability is classified as 30% of your income. So you should mm -hmm. not be spending more than 30% of your income on yes. housing. Mm -hmm. But so 30% before COVID, it's up to more than 50%. They don't know the real numbers right now because it's changing all the time. Changing all the but time, it's over 50% of, of renters now in Canada are paying more than half of their income on rent. And some of that income is probably on the government program that we have called CERB, yes. uh, which is based on minimum wage, uh, full-time minimum wage, which is on average, they fit, figured out the average, which is around 1150 an hour. Mm -hmm. Just not a very. That's not, it's much. not a good wage. It's not much. Yeah, especially given much. the the very expensive housing in the major cities here and yes. all over the U.S. too. Yes, yes, and I know Toronto. The housing prices are ridiculous. I know. I know. Obviously, I know Vancouver from personal experience. Super expensive in Vancouver, and this is the housing expense is not just limited to the United States, United States major cities in the United States and Canadian major cities. Let's not forget, some of the most expensive real estate in the world is outside of this country. Try renting a flat in London. Try finding a place to live in Paris, France. Good luck renting a property in Hong Kong. Singapore is impossibly expensive to rent a house or to buy a home. So let's not let's 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 really take a look at this this isn't just big cities in the u.s and canada where the country code is a one where only the housing is expensive there no this is in a lot of countries and a lot of major cities around the world 
And even in some not major cities, housing is still expensive. And part of that is based upon per capita income or household income within that particular area relative to the prices of housing in that jurisdiction. So, yeah, I think that one thing that's noteworthy to mention as well is yes. that so housing prices have gone up and rental prices have gone up yes. significantly in all of these places, exactly. but mm -hmm. the wages have stagnated oh. over the last 20 to 30 years yes. for the most part. And so mm -hmm. that's why this is actually called a crisis. And that's why it is a crisis, because if people are, are making the same amount or like have a very steady, like low incline in their mm -hmm. wages, then like the housing should be around the same, but the housing is going way, way up, which is yes. what is causing this, um, this unaffordability and the crisis yes. all over the world. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, Catherine, I would, even, I would even say it's a crisis because crisis is too sanitized a word to describe what is actually happening. I would say this is a catastrophe. Yeah, this is I a catastrophe. Agree. This is a housing catastrophe. Yeah. Because let's not forget, let's, let, let's remember this. The wages have not really adjusted for inflation over the past 40 years, at least in the United States. The, if, if wages were to have adjusted with inflation in the United States, minimum wage would be somewhere between 23 and $27. Yeah, it's okay? not at all. And it's not, no, it, it, minimum wage might be a third of that in the United States. Yeah. And there's no way that anybody making, let's say, $15 an hour, which is a lot of what new jobs are hiring for now. If you go to Target, Whole Foods, wherever, they're you yeah, know, $15 an hour, great. No. So when you see these politicians that are coming out saying, hey, let's fight for 15 no, you shouldn't be fighting for 15 You should be fighting for more like 30 because that's really what the minimum wage should be. It's really what the minimum wage should be. So, and again, when you talk about, we're talking about wages and wealth inequality and quite honestly, black people being locked out of not being able to buy a house, really, really, I guess from a, from a, from a, from a, I guess a legal situation, black people were supposed to have 40 acres and a mule back in 1865. That never happened. So the conventional wisdom was, okay, hey, you know what? Black people get 40 acres and a mule. Hey, we'll just farm the land. But you know what else you can do with land? You can build a house on land. You can build more than one house on land. You can build a community on land and a city with land. And 40 acres is a lot of land. 40 acres is a lot of land. Because when you go back to... This is Frank, so when Benjamin Franklin created what's called the North American land use system. For, when you have 640 acres, that is a square mile. When you have 36 square miles, that is a township. So these are just larger subdivisions of a small geographic space of land that's equivalent to 43,560 square feet or an acre. So black people were supposed to get 40 acres and a mule when you could build a house and plant vegetables and do all sorts of stuff we didn't get that so can't really buy can't really build a house on land that we didn't get yikes yeah yikes and, yeah and that's a that's a a way that this this racism has just been perpetuated through, through absolutely it's, you know land is has always been sort of the most uh I guess, valuable piece of whatever in, in our society. Asset, thank you. <laughs> asset. It's yeah. the most valuable asset. That's why it's called real estate. Because yeah. last time I checked, land doesn't really depreciate. Never. Land always appreciates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we continue on with the history in 1877. 1877 was essentially the end of Reconstruction. It's like, okay, well, bye-bye. So black people ended up losing a lot of their rights that we quite honestly died for. And again, many of the reconstruction amendments, most notably the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments came during that time. But then the South wanted to become a part of the United States. So then the South was like, okay, Hey, you know what? We'll 
return black people to their second class citizenship status. And you know what? Yeah, we're not giving them access to houses. We're not giving them access to anything. So what happened? Jim Crow laws set in, which furthered the problems for black people. So black people, there was a massive movement called the Great Migration. So black people that were typically congregated in the South ended up moving to the North and ended up moving out West. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. So we're continuing on with this discussion because Jim Crow laws happened around 1890-ish, okay? So in 1910 in Los Angeles, rather multicultural, multinational city, big city, 1910, the Los Angeles City Council passed the first zoning ordinance in the United States. You're probably like, well, Joe, why is that important? Why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Because with that zoning ordinance, what they did is it separated areas between residential homes and commercial homes. Residential areas, commercial areas. If you go down to, if you're in downtown Los Angeles, there are places where you it's clearly residential. There are places where it's clearly industrial or commercial, and there's not much of a transition zone in between. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see both. Now, part of the reason why the Los Angeles City Council back in 1908 decided to separate these areas was because they wanted to make sure that they had a separation to protect from noise and industry. So, hey, if you have a bunch of people working with iron or a bunch of carpenters or a bunch of butchers, keep them out of that way over there. You know, I live in a house. I'm trying to sleep. I need my rest. Here's what it also did. Laundries. Laundries were also part of industry. So in Los Angeles, they wanted to make sure that the laundry industry was primarily dominated by Chinese people. So what they wanted to do was make sure that Chinese people stayed away from white people. So now that's in addition to black people being locked out of home ownership in certain areas, happened in Los Angeles. So Chinese people ended up living not in residential areas, but in commercial areas or industrial zones because their businesses were tied to their wealth and they couldn't get access to loans back then either, which is why, which might be a reason why there are so many Chinatowns across the United States. Because if it happened there, it, it, one will notice a pattern. When you'll see a lot of these zoning laws, it happened in one city. Other cities are like, shit, you know, we work there. Let's try it here. And then end up, whoa, this works pretty well. We can, we can segregate black people. We can segregate Chinese people based upon the, the, the jobs that they typically dominate. Perfect. Let's try it here. You're going to notice a pattern, Catherine. Mm -hmm. You're going to notice a pattern. Now, many of you all know that I'm in Baltimore, Charm City. I'm here. In 1910, Baltimore, so 110 years ago, Baltimore was the very first city to adopt a racial zoning code. I'm going to say that again real slow and real deliberately. Baltimore, Maryland was the first city in the United States to adopt a racial zoning code. Well, Joe, what is a racial zoning code? A racial zoning code is, hey, you know what? You're black. You can't live in this area. Hey, you're white. You can live in this area. Oh, there's a majority of black people that live on this block. I'm sorry, there's a majority of white people that live on this block. Hey, black person, you can't live on this block because it's against zoning rules. Can't do it. Sorry, you got to live somewhere else. That happened in Baltimore. That happened in Baltimore. And I've been reading this wonderful book, The Color of Law, which talks about racial segregation. And I'm going to read you a quote from this book from the lawyer that actually created this, le this legislation. And the guy's name is Milton Dashiel. Okay, and I'm going to read this real quick here. It says here, in 1910, Baltimore adopted an ordinance prohibiting African Americans from buying homes on blocks where whites were a majority and vice versa. Milton Dashiel, the lawyer who drafted Baltimore's ordinance, explained, quote, Ordinarily, the Negro loves to gather to himself, for he is very gregarious and sociable in his nature. But those who have risen somewhat above their fellows appear to have an intense desire to leave them behind, to disown them, as it were, and get as close to the company of white people as circumstances will permit them. Good job, Baltimore. There. Yeah. Good job, oh Baltimore. Uh, 
Yeah. What the fuck, this Baltimore? Fun. We did this <laughs> shit. Yeah. And guess what happened after that, Catherine? It started in Baltimore. So other cities like Chicago was like, you know what? Shit, they're doing this to black people here? Let's try it. New York. Let's work it. Let's go for this. San Antonio, Texas. Yeah, we'll do it to you. Oh, and we'll do it to some Latino brothers and sisters too. We'll try it down there. Miami. Yeah. So a lot of other cities tried the same practice. We're saying, hey, racial zoning laws. If you're black and a whole bunch of white people live in this area, you can't live in this area. Started here in Baltimore. I mean, it's the same in Toronto. I think that mm -hmm. those, those, I guess the legacy of those zoning laws are still so apparent in all of those yes. spaces, uh, including here in Toronto where I live. Uh, it's just so problematic because it's perpetuated by the developers and the real estate agents, whether they yes. know it or not. I mean, <laughs> some there is some aspect of, of questioning on, on whether an individual knows about this stuff, but mm -hmm. typically if a real estate person shows you a house and knows your ethnicity, they're going to show you a certain kind of house in a certain kind of neighborhood to keep yeah. everybody segregated because it's, it, it's blatantly from these, the legacy of these laws, whether they're still active or not. It's so, yeah. so blatant. I Same know. with renting and in, in anywhere. The, the system we have set up, land owners can choose who they rent to and the racism is so blatant so blatant i know i know especially in places like <sighs> the cities that we live where rent is it's competitive to find a, a place to to live yeah, it is it is it is i um I'm, I'm just thinking about when i was married and me and my ex-wife bought a house my ex-wife was white and she made a whole lot more money than me so it was her name on the mortgage and I would pay my cut of the rent and, every, and the, the house and all of that. I remember the first time we moved out of the apartment we used to live in and then she decided to rent an apartment because she was pregnant. I didn't go see the house. I didn't go see the house. I was playing shows one weekend. Next weekend, I'm like, oh shit, we're moving. Okay. And it was in a really nice neighborhood in the north side of Baltimore City. I'll be willing to bet you that if I had been there with her there's probably a decent chance that that renter would not have rented to us. Mm -hmm. I, and I'll be will, and there is historical precedent for this. And we'll talk about that in the little bit of time that we have left because we got to get moving. Um, there's mortgage rent, there's mortgage interest deduction. That's, you know, that's okay because it blocked out black people again, because again, there's a theme to all of this and, we have 24 minutes left. Okay. In 1916, New York City, and I just mentioned New York City. Have you ever been to New York City? You'll notice that New York City has certain districts, and certain districts are named after certain types of work that was done in those districts historically. So you'll have the meatpacking district. You'll have the diamond district. You'll have the flat iron district. You'll have Chinatown. In 1916, zoning ordinances were created. So it restricted the heights of buildings, and then it broke down the types of buildings into three categories, residential, commercial, and retail. So, for example, the Diamond District is, I think, in the upper east side, kind of upper, it's an upper midtown. It's primarily Jewish, and most of the people there sell diamonds. It's retail. You go to the Diamond District, you're buying a diamond. It's an engagement ring or a bracelet. That's what you're doing there. If you go to the Garment District, which is just north of Tribeca, in, in, in downtown, you're buying clothes or you're getting, got, you're getting fabric to buy clothes. If you go to the meatpacking district, that area was for butchers. That's what they did there. If you go to the upper west side of Manhattan, that's residential. There's not really a whole lot of business going on up there. Why? Because there's a whole lot of rich white folks that don't want to hear, don't want to live next to slaughterhouses or next to factories where people were building, making shoes and clothing. Leave that shit all the way down there. 30 minutes on the train away, so I don't have to hear it. I don't have to smell pig's blood. Mm -hmm. That way, that way, downwind, so I don't have to smell it either. That happened in New York City, and it broke apart the city. It broke apart the city. So, <sighs> we could be talking here all day about this stuff. Good I know. Lord. 
Jesus there's so much involved in, in how these like policies sort of got implemented and just the the aftermath and the impact of of humans and how it's still like so prominent today it's just yep. mind-boggling to me it, it's it's bananas yeah it's bananas and heavy base 25 saying with central park to separate it all mm. yes and most people may not know this but the world's most valuable undeveloped plot of land is central park if central park were to be a developed property an acre of that land might go for tens of millions of dollars tens of millions of dollars maybe more because there's a it's a big plot of land undeveloped you know a couple of playgrounds a restaurant tavern on the green it's a really nice restaurant um moma is on on 87th or 88th street but that's kind of it it's kind of it it's been relatively undeveloped for a long time now there's a court case that happened in 1917 it was buchanan versus warley and this happened in of all cities louisville kentucky and now i'm going to take a minute to remind everybody that brianna taylor's killers have not been arrested and she was in louisville so let's arrest those four fucking cops, please. Mm -hmm. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. In su the Supreme Court had a zoning ordinance where there was work in, in Louisville, Kentucky, where he said, hey, you know what? If, if you live in a white neighborhood, you can't sell to a black person. And if you're a black person living in a black neighborhood, you can't sell to a white person. Can't do it. And the Supreme Court was like, ah... Nah, come on. That's illegal. That's bullshit. Stop that. If you have a house, you can sell it to whomever you wanted. So in order to keep the racism going, what ended up happening is it led to what's called single family zoning. So you have a plot of land, you have one house, one family, and then you zone that particular plot of land for that particular family. So what happened is in certain areas where houses were more expensive than others, it effectively priced black people out of these particular neighborhoods. So it ended up recreating another type of segregation without actually mentioning race in the legislation. So all of this happened. Federal government for about three or four years, between 1917 and 1921, promoted family home ownership to white folks. Didn't mention black people at all. They're like, oh, no, you black people, now you, you find your own shit. We want, to, we want to make sure that white folks have houses, not black people. Mm. In 1919, St. Louis, they created exclusionary zoning ordinances. They said, hey, you know what? Um, you can build anything, anything you want, except a single, family, a single family home in certain areas. So you build anything you want except a single family home. So what happened? So what happened? It was like, well, wait a minute. I can't. Black people were just like, well, wait a minute. I can't build anything here. I can't build anything. I don't have the money to do it. So what happened is black people, again, were locked out of these, buying these homes. They were completely forced out of buying these homes because of that, because of that, because of that exclusionary zoning ordinance. Again, the racism just continues to build and build and build and build and build. Um, there's more court cases. I mean, let me know what you let me know when you want to jump yeah, in. I was just going to say something I'm noticing as you kind of go through this is how uh, I hate to use the word smart, but how smart the wording is becoming through all of these Shrewd. policy. Yeah, thank you. Shrewd. Because it's it's becoming more obvious what is being left out rather than what is being included. Perfect. And, and I think that that is a really um, interesting way in which these policies get passed because they don't obviously seem blatantly racist initially. So they exactly. get passed and then mm -hmm. the, the, the outcome is ridiculously racist. Exactly. It, in how it's implemented and used. And so I think that is something very noteworthy that we need to <clears throat> bring attention to because this shit is still happening today. This is, this is how problematic policies are still being written. It's mm -hmm. about who's being excluded rather than 
what is included in these in these new policies. A thousand percent, absolutely. And this is why, when I had my my signs, and you know, no justice, no peace. I've been saying policy, policy, mm -hmm. policy, policy, because you can say no justice, no peace all day. But if I want to buy that four hundred thousand dollar house and I've got a seven forty five credit score, and $230,000 down for a down payment and I still can't get the house, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That is a problem. And that is a racism problem. And that is a policy problem. In 1926 in Euclid, Ohio, Euclid, Ohio versus Ambler Realty, Ambler Realty. And the Supreme Court ruled that municipal zoning regulations in Ohio were unconstitutional. So cities were like, hey, you know what? Let's just start zoning everything. So what happened is 75% of United States cities ended up zoning land for single family houses. The zoning was exclusionary and that made segregation even worse. So what it did, it forced governments to invest more in the suburbs and it forced governments to invest less in parks and schools and it completely put more nuisances, more crime, more businesses that people didn't want in their neighborhood, the whole NIMBY philosophy, not in my backyard, well, they put them in black people's backyards. And as a result, more resources got sent towards white neighborhoods and fewer resources got sent to black neighborhoods. Now you're probably like, well, Joe, Joe, nice. How does this apply now? What are we talking about? Let's go back to Baltimore. Let's go back to Baltimore. Because if you take a look at, for example, when I used to work on the west side of Baltimore, that whole area that I used to work in on the west side of Baltimore, there is no banks, no grocery stores, no grocery stores. Um, there's six elementary schools. There's not a single high school. And there's a hospital, and the hospital is not in great condition. Okay? Trash all over the place. Let's take that to, for example, for example Roland Park. Roland Park, really nice area, loads of grocery stores, really good schools, including the private schools, bike lanes, bike lanes, mm -hmm. yes, banks all over the place. There's a Whole Foods, there's Mom's Market down at the Rotunda, a bunch of resources. Again, zoning laws, you're seeing it happen. And that happened, in, that's in Euclid, Ohio, not exactly the, the cradle of civilization. So if it can happen in Euclid, so if it, if it can happen in Euclid, Ohio, it can happen in 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 Toronto. It can happen in Buffalo, New York. It can happen in Boston, Massachusetts. Eight years later, the Federal Housing, the FHA, they said, "You know what? Hey, we want to make sure people buy homes. We're coming out of this great whole Great Depression thing. We need people to buy homes because you know what." Home ownership is a great way to build wealth. So the Federal Housing Administration insured loans in white areas. Well, okay. Well, so your, your, your obvious question would be, well, wait a minute. What about black areas, Joe? Mm -hmm. well, what did they do? They took a red marker. And I'm going to find my red marker this time. <laughs> Here it is. They took one of these. They got a map and they said, you know what, we're going to draw red lines and red circles around these areas where we know there's a high concentration of black people. And we're not going to rent, we're not going to give them access to loans. And we're not going to insure their mortgages. We're not going to do shit for these black people because we drew red lines around these maps. Mm -hmm. This practice is what's called redlining. Mm -hmm. And that happened. The federal government approved it. They said, yeah, yeah, let's do it some more. So then... The Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, also said, you know what? Not only are we not going to give black people access to these loans, we're going to continue to loan money for white people in suburban areas. And we're not going to put money into cities. Because, quite honestly, the white people are a better bet with government funds than black people. Even though when it's government funding, it's supposed to be, rent it's supposed to be distributed equally. But that's not what happened. So, the FHA said, you know what? Yeah, white is right. Black, nah, we ain't doing it for you. 
So that's why all these suburbs got really good, nice houses, really strong houses, and had better schools and better roads and better infrastructure. That's why when you go to the, some certain areas of, in Baltimore and certain areas in other large metropolitan areas, it's like, well, oh, shit. Yikes. These buildings are falling down. These schools had lead pipes in them. These houses had lead paint in them. There's asbestos composite tile in the basement, in the basement floors of some of these homes. Uh, why did this happen? That's why it happened. Yeah, and I find it really interesting, like, I guess just for those who have been following our chats, like, through the, the last few weeks, I think it's really apparent that, like, all of these things are so interconnected and, mm -hmm. and you know, we've talked about all of this stuff in, in little tidbits and we're kind of bringing it all together now. And I, I think mm -hmm. that's really cool. So thank you for facilitating that as well. That's, you know what? And you know great. what? You know what? You know what? We're going to take a quick pause for the cause and thank you and thank you because, because there's a whole lot of white people that would like to have these sorts of discussions, but I'm necessarily sure how to have them or they're maybe apprehensive or they might be afraid or they would be like, well, you know what? I don't know how to talk about race with another black person because these are difficult conversations and I'm not really, I don't know. <sighs> Thank you. Because there's, again, there's a whole lot of white people that would like to do what you're doing, but I'm not necessarily sure they, they, they're, they're digging deep down to themselves to get to that point where they feel like they want to have these conversations, where they feel like they want to actually put the energy and effort into being anti-racist, where they want to say, hey, you know what? Shit. I actually want to be a better white person, but not just a better white person. I want to be a better human being. So thank you. Thanks. I think that, uh, I think that part of this uh, aside, I guess, that we're going on is just um, that I have been trying to learn about this stuff for a long time and I have always been interested in it. So I just yes. want to encourage other white people to keep going. And this yes. is a great start. These conversations, like we're, we're facilitating this for people to learn and to go off and like learn more about these issues themselves. Exactly. And so I, to that, I just want to say that like you can do this, <laughs> but if you don't feel comfortable yet, like reach out because both of us are here to help you and facilitate yep. whatever we can in exactly. order to have these conversations and keep the, the conversation alive because we've both seen the, the silence is setting in now on our, on our social media. The silence is deafening. People, yeah, where people who are active and anti-racist and whatever, like, you know, they're, they're not as active anymore. And yeah. to be honest, I haven't been as active myself, but I think, having a friend to keep going with is so important. And, and so I know both of us are here for that. So if, if you I need know. a friend to keep, keep I, you going, reach out to us. <laughs> exactly. That's what friends are for, Catherine. You know, yeah. that. you know, yeah, that. Totally. You know that. Absolutely. Um, we got about 10 minutes left and I got about 30 minutes of content because there's a oh lot more to go with this. So I'm going to try to move through this as quickly as I can and try to cover the major bits and pieces all right. Perfect. Thank um, you. The FHA's evil twin brother is Fannie Mae. I'm like, well, wait a minute. What does Fannie Mae do? Well, Fannie Mae created low-cost mortgage loans for a whole lot of people. But who did Fannie Mae get their mortgage insurance from? The FHA. Right. So Fannie Mae bought a whole lot of mortgages from banks and said, you know what? Um... We're going to lend a whole lot of money to a whole lot of people. Oh, but we're following FHA guidelines. And the FHA guidelines said, uh, we're insuring the mortgages. We can't rent to black people. So guess what the FHA did? And well, guess what Fannie Mae did? Ding! Got the red marker out. They did that. Back in 1938, 120 Billion with a B dollars of loans went out to building and new houses. Black people and people of color got 2%. 2%. 2%. Now, just, just so hmm? that people are aware, 
black people, like just black people, not including all the other people of color in America, make up 13% of the population, like Perfect. as we speak. So Well, well, thank you very to... much for adding that on. Just mm -hmm. a little more context. So just yeah. to show you how the inequality is so vast, $120 billion and black folks got 2% of that $120 billion. Yikes. And you wonder why wealth inequality is what it is. There you go. Okay, so now the FHA and Fannie Mae essentially institutionalized these racist housing policies. They said, you know what? Shit, this is a great deal. There's plenty of white folks making us money. Let's just keep this going. And that kept going until 1968 with the, with the indoctrination of the Fair Housing Act. We'll get to that in a little bit. But 1944, the GI Bill, you had a whole bunch of black people that were fighting for the United States, but ended up coming back to a country that wasn't willing to fight for them. I'm going to make sure I, I'm going to say that again. You had a whole lot of black people that came that fought overseas, but they came back to a country that didn't want to fight for them. So the GI Bill said, hey, you know what? Um, we got all these soldiers. They need houses. We're going to rent you and get you some loans. But, you know, we're going to follow these FHA guidelines. Oh, I'm saying all you black folks that, that were fighting in World War II, that fought for the United States, land of the free and home of the brave. Y'all brothers and sisters are locked out. We're not, renting, we're not giving you any money. Sorry. That happened. Federal government. So even if you fought, even if you were in a quote unquote anti-racist environment like the United States military, where promotions and upward mobility is based upon meritocracy, you come back and you still don't get the benefits of being a United States citizen. You still don't get the benefits of fighting for, of, of, of fighting for your country and getting access to home loans through the GI Bill. This is Ridiculous. It's so blatant. I, I, yeah, it's, it's so infuriating because it's so blatant. But we just, we don't talk about this stuff. And it's just, oh my goodness. It's just, it's, that was only, you know, 70 years ago. That's not far. That's not long away. That's not far. It's not far. In 1956, the National Interstate and Defense Highways Act created what's known as the Interstate System of the United States. Mm -hmm. We have a bunch of really big roads that allow for public transportation and private transportation. Mm -hmm. So what happened? A lot of these roads ended up getting built and crushing black communities. Yeah. And they put then they moved these interstate highways away from predominantly white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. That happened. Those. They bulldozed the black folks and they built these big, noisy, awful roads right yes. over top of them. Yeah. Yes, yes. And there is, and I think it's the Fourth Amendment of the United States, which actually says, hey, you know what? We actually can do this through what's called eminent domain. So if the government says, hey, you know what? Um, we're the government. And we think it's a really good idea in terms of the benefit of the public to build a road right here. We're going to take your property and we'll pay you pay fair market value and fuck off. Go somewhere else. Live somewhere else. Do something else. That's eminent domain. That happened through 19, in 1956 with the Federal Highway Act of 19, Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, building highways in predominantly black neighborhoods. Happened in Baltimore. Happened in Washington, D.C. If you remember the movie Scarface. If you ever seen the movie Scarface in the beginning of the sort of in the beginning of the movie, when they're all uh, where they're all in that refugee camp underneath that highway, underneath that road, that road is Interstate 95. If you've ever been to Miami, I-95 cuts, cleaves Miami in half. And then you go across the bridges and you're in South Beach. And Miami is cut down the middle by I-95. You can look at it on a map. It's right there. It's all there for you. And guess what? Guess what happened in Miami? Oh, this course. they did that there too yeah they course. did it there too they did it there too so long before will smith said welcome to miami they were doing that in miami they were building roads and putting haitians in one area and cubans in another and well-to-do white people on, in south beach and on star island that's what they were doing in miami they did that Fair Housing Act of 1968, and that was, you know, that basically said, hey, you know what? Um, we're going to make everybody, we're going to get rid of this segregation in housing because 
It's supposed to be fair. It's supposed to be housing, fair housing. It's supposed to do that. Um, it's a couple other laws. We have about three minutes left. But again, all of this, there's a, there's a one court case that I absolutely want to discuss, and I took notes on it here. It's Jones versus Mayer. Happened in 1965 in St. Louis. Joseph Lee Jones is a black guy. Joseph Lee Jones might as well be me. Barbara Joe Jones is his wife. Looks like you. They go and said, and they, they said, hey, you know what? We're going to the Alfred Mayer Company to buy a house. We want to buy a house. Alfred Mayer Company is like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is black guy. It's my husband. We're not selling to you. Get out. Three years later, after three years of court cases, the Supreme Court said, you know what? Yeah, come on. Nah, shit's illegal. You can't be doing that. And that was in St. Louis, 1968. Not that long ago. It's, yeah. That's heartbreaking. Not that long ago. You had the whole subprime mortgage situation. Mm -hmm. We talked about during when I mentioned Steve Mnuchin, where nearly 10 million people lost their homes. I shouldn't even say lost their homes because that's a sanitized way of saying it. 10 million people had their homes taken by banks. Let's rephrase it because we're going to use proper language when we talk about these sorts of things. We're not sanitizing anything. That's what happened. And now you're going to have COVID-19 where a whole bunch of people are going to be without jobs. There's 50 million people unemployed. People aren't getting unemployment anymore. Rent moratoriums are going to be over. Mortgage moratoriums are going to be done. And there's going to be a whole lot of people that are going to be kicked out and evicted from homes and apartments. Yeah, I wish we had time issues. to talk about homelessness too, because, oh my goodness, that's another issue that is uh, just a really important topic to be addressing, especially given the pandemic right now. Yes, it's, uh, yes. Yeah, like you say, it's going to be a lot more of an issue now. And once you become homeless, it's very, very hard to not be homeless anymore. So mm -hmm. this is going to be a, a major issue in the coming months. It's going to be a major uh, and issue. it's going to be a lasting issue. And yes. again, it is absolutely racialized. And it's, it's yeah, it's, it's something that I, yeah, I think we should probably do an, a whole episode on. <laughs> we, we could, we could, that could be a mini series. Yeah, we could have exactly. a whole mini series exactly. just yeah. on homelessness. Yeah, um, sure. we, we probably got, what, about a minute left, maybe? A, a minute, yeah, just over just over a minute. Okay. All right. That's a good DJ timing. All right. Um, resources. Joe, how can I learn more about this? Go out, buy this book. And go buy it off Amazon. Mm. Buy it at a local bookstore, The Color of Law, by Professor Richard Rothstein. He's a professor at Cal Berkeley. Really smart guy. I'm about a third of the way through this book. Read this book. If you want to learn about how racial, how, how racist the housing policies are in the United States, start here. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you You're so welcome. much. You were so prepared for all of these with amazing information that is so important. Uh, and so I just want to thank you again. It's been You're very welcome, it's always Catherine. a pleasure. Pleasure's always mine, my dear. Pleasure's yeah. always mine. What are we going to talk about next week? Next week, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about mental health. We're going to talk about self-care. And we're going to talk about how politics in both Canada and the states are involved in all of that and how I like all of that. Yeah. Or it could be one of those three or all of the three. We'll I figure think... it out. We'll figure it out. We'll figure exactly. it out. But look, Catherine, thank you so much. You're the best. Mwah. We'll talk again soon. Yes. Thank you. Out to everybody that watched thank today. You. We appreciate you. We love you. And we do this because we care. We do this because we care. Sharing is caring. If you like what we do, share it. Put it on your social medias. If you don't like what we do, tell us. We're adults. We can handle That's the true. heat. Yeah. If and you're it's... curious about something, reach out. Ask more questions. We're always we, here to help. We, we are here for you. We're here yes. for you. Always. Okay? <laughs> All right. Amazing. Take care. We'll talk soon. Take care. Peace and love, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>